Good evening and welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York and to the seventh season of our Artists and Lecture Series. My name is Victoria Dangle and I'm the Executive Director of the organization. Uh, I'd like to say that this program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. I'm very happy to give an, an extra special warm welcome to our program officer from the DCA, Samantha Toy, who has joined us this evening. So welcome, Samantha, and thank you for your support. Uh, for those of you uh, less familiar with the organization, I just would like to take a few minutes to explain the organization to you. And well, we were founded in 1785 by the skilled craftsmen of New York City, artisans who represented 22 different trades, including carpenters, saddlers, tailors, and silversmiths, among others. Today, our 231-year-old organization continues to serve the people of the city of New York through its educational and cultural programs, which include our Mechanics Institute, the General Society Library, and our nearly two-century-old lecture series, of which the Artisan Series is a part. You'll find additional information about the Society on your uh, seats. The space you are in tonight, the magnificent space, if I might add, uh, you are in tonight is the Library of the General Society. It was founded in 1820, and it's the second oldest library in New York City and one of the city's three remaining membership libraries. But you can join for as little as $35 as a senior citizen or $50 for adults. And I'd say that's a good deal. <laughs> um, and so tonight we gather once more to pay tribute to the art of craftsmanship. The Artisan Lecture Series has committed itself to giving voice to internationally known artisans who will talk about the intricacies of their specialized crafts. The mission of the Artisan Lecture Series is to promote the work and art of skilled craftsmen to assist in ensuring that their unique knowledge is understood and carried forth for generations to come. Tonight, we are very delighted to have Lucas Ronsky, violin maker, who is descended from a family whose artistic traditions stretch back for centuries. Tonight, he will explain the process of creating a violin from start to finish, and will describe the history of violin making and discuss how the violin was invented and its development over the centuries. The evening will conclude with a short performance from acclaimed violinist, virtuoso Kinga Augustin, playing a violin made by Mr. Ronsky. Louis Ronsky was born in Poland and started playing the violin at age nine and made his first violin at age 13. This experience launched his long study of violin making and music, including his Master of Arts degree in violin making. After decades of extensive training and working for distinguished ateliers of violin making all over the world, Mr. Ronsky opened his own violin making atelier in New York in 2012 and became the owner of Lucas Violins. His instruments have received numerous awards and have been appreciated by many great musicians. It is my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Lucas Ronsky. Thank you so much. Good evening. Um, I would like to thank you, Victoria, uh, for a great invitation. I really love this place. I've been here maybe three times already, and the, all the lectures are, were really fantastic. So I'm so happy that I can really share my craft, which is maybe around uh, 500 years old um, to these days. Uh, um, there is uh, the violin making generally is the very old craft and which has changed very little in nearly 500 years old. And even though this profession is so old and we have been cultivating it so strongly, we still don't know many things about it. Um, let me do it a little bit more. Uh, for instance, um, where in 17th century they were getting wood from, what varnish did they use, the way the wood was treated and what kind of methods they had to create such unique instruments with the finest quality of sound or just a question 
who actually made the first violin. This is my atelier, uh, which is on Upper West Side. Many of you um, visited me. Victoria, you are very invited. <laughs> and today I will try to tell you very shortly about violin making. Uh, it history followed with short TV documentary uh, from Handcrafted America, which luckily they visited me last year. Um, the presentation will be enriched by our virtuoso, King Augustine. She will play on my violin I've made, and another violin would be uh, an old violin from 1734. Those parts you can see on the video, they are my instruments, which some of them you can actually see on the table. You are welcome to touch, uh, smell, don't break them, but you can, you know, you can easily see what kind of wood uh, we use for violins, and uh, they are on the table uh, um, behind you. The violins always were one of the most important instruments in history. Uh, for its special function in music and life. Because of that, a violin maker had a very important position and function in society. More violins are made today than in other time in history. We make, we make them from the same materials like they used to make, the same type of wood, the same type of tools we use like they used to use in 17th, 18th century. You can see planes, gouges, uh, chisels, um, if you visit my workshop, you can see the same basically tools which they used to use. We make instruments, violin makers who make instruments like violins, violas, cellos, basses, and also bows. Although the origins of both instruments uh, go back thousands of years, it was the artistic and cultural development of Europe during the Renaissance that set the stage for the de development of modern violin family. And thinking about Renaissance, we think about Italy, especially the northern part of Italy. By the 16th century, northern Italy had for some time been a center of fine wood carving and instrument making. Sources of wood, and other supplies were already established. There are mountains, dolomites. And Venice was one of the world's major seaports and functions as a link between East and West. That's why um, many wood came from Venice to Cremona and Brescia, from Venice. We have to understand also the, 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 the part of the history and, the, and the, from, from the Renaissance time. Sources which tell us the intellectual basis of the Renaissance was its own invented version of humanism derived from the rediscovery of classical Greek philosophy. This new thinking became manifest in art, music, politics, science, and also it appeared in instrument making field. These rules which musical instruments are connected uh, to archaic definitions of beauty and measurements from Vitruvius to Mersen. Shape of the violins are connected to archaic de definitions of beauty. On the right picture, there's a geometric analysis uh, of the Stradivari uh, viola from 1690. In the same way as Renaissance architecture, the dimensions of forms are related to the dimensions and intervals of our musical composition, nature and beauty, rather than the more familiar division of our contemporary yardstick. We can talk about these times, uh, of course, but let's focus maybe more on violins, which um, it, it was <coughs> logical development of three instruments uh, from that time. Uh, first is Lira da Braccio, then Rebeck, and Renaissance fiddle. Um, 
Why it happened? Because at that time it responds to demands for more volume uh, of sound and changes in playing style and music. First violin ancestor was Lira da Braccio, which during the 16th century, three sizes were known. The instrument was shaped essentially like a violin, but with a wider fingerboard, flatter bridge. Generally, it had seven strings, which five were tuning like a violin, and lower uh, were added uh, to strings as a drone, and were usually tuned in octaves. The second one, the second an ancestor of the violin is the rebec. Rebec is a boat instrument that was used many centuries before the creation of the violin. Derived from the Arab rebab, had been in use since the 10th century, and actually is still used until this today in, in Arabic music. Uh, is a simple instrument using two, three, or four gut strings, in general carved from a single block of wood. It was as an accompaniment for the troubadours and for dancers. The third one is one of the most famous instruments in medieval ages, Renaissance fiddle. Um, uh, fiddle had a neck, body, and pipe box that was carved from the solid block of wood. The neck and pipe box are carved from the single piece of maple and attached to the body with a wood screw, and it's carved from a solid block. A little rosette is in the middle. There are ribs which are constructed and bended uh, on the hot iron. So those three instruments, they were three ancestors of the violin. And we actually, we don't know who made the first violin and where it was. We can, uh, there's so many speculation that actually it was in Italy. And probably yes, but there are many mu musicologists and experts this day. They also claim that it was it come from Poland. And here, actually, on this picture, you can see from 10th century to 16, uh, how a little bit different changings with f holes and instruments. Those. Early made instruments uh, as 1560 are still in regular use today and are the, in most respect identical to their more recent counterparts. It's amazing how, uh, how the instruments uh, survived because we, we actually still play on these violins and uh, Kinga was going to play on the violin from 1734. And in these times, those instruments, they um, spread out in Europe very quickly because violin, it was, it was a beautiful instrument, the, the sound was louder, um, and it, it was very much popular um, in all Europe of the court dance and also street musicians. In the early 1500s, the first violins, which we know, came from the workshop of Andrea Amati in Cremona. This is the oldest violin which su uh, survived and dated from 5055. Uh, Andrea Amati, we call him the father of violin making. We know he's the oldest violin, and the violins it, um, <coughs> became very popular among the nobility, illustrated by the fact that French King Charles IX ordered uh, Amati uh, to build a whole orchestra in the second half of the 16th century, and he ordered, I believe, 14 instruments that actually survived to, the, to these days. Uh, the, the years from 1650 to 1750 
were a golden age of violin making. Nicola Amati, son of Andrea Amati, the, it was the last and greatness of Amati uh, line of violin makers, was almost single-handed responsible for the emergence of many famous masters of the era. He was a um, teacher of Antonio Stradivari, for, for example, as well as Andrea Guarneri and mo one of the most famous Giuseppe Guarneri del Gesù. This is a cute painting of Antonio Stradivari. Of course, we don't know how he looked like, but uh, you can see a little bit mess in the workshop. Like, it looks like mine. <laughs> um, uh, other famous makers included, include uh, Gasparo da Salo, uh, Paolo Maggini, they, they, they were from uh, Brescia. Uh, then Bergonzi, Ruggeri, uh, Guadagnini, they were also very famous uh, makers which we admire uh, to these days, and we also make make them make copies of those instruments. Uh, those famous violin makers lived and worked basically in Cremona, and this little town, 450 uh, years, was home of the greatest violin makers in history. You can see there's very small town with a um, little square. And I have a chance to be in Cremona and, 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 and work around a year before I came to the States. And it was really great because uh, I have met so many good makers and the great energy and vibe in this town is really incredible. Um, to this day, instruments from the golden age of violin making, especially those made by Stradivari, and Guarneri are the most sought after instruments by both collectors and performers. Those violins became to be collecting objects as an art object. If there is a very well known violin, viola, cello, or a bow in its superb condition and it produces a very good sound, it's going to have three values. Uh, first one is for the collector as an R object. The second one will be for musicians for its potential, uh, tonal potential, which for most musicians is the most important. And the third one is as an investment. Instruments these days are great investment uh, on the market too. Um, I would like to right now maybe not uh, uh, tell about too much history because this, we, we can talk about really um, about Stradivari, Guarneri, about instruments from Cremona, from, uh, from Italy, from uh, France, Germany. There were so many different uh, styles and, and groups of makers later. Uh, but I think you, for sure you'll be interested what kind of uh, wood we use and, and, and about the instrument itself. Um, uh, the primary woods uh, uh, used in violin making is spruce and maple. You can see the big um, chunks of wood over there, and this is just prepared inside uh, for to be stored. At least it has to be, stay like in this in this in this way at least six years. Then I c then we can make it something after afterwards. Of course, a little bit older is better. Mm. And spruce is chosen for the top of the violin. Also, we call it front. It's light in weight. And um, maple is used by back, sides, and, and the scroll. And the figures on the, on the flame of the maple is the most prominent feature of maple. There are so many steps from in, in making instruments, of course, to choose the right wood, the best acoustically wood, uh, which uh, is the most important, the, the, is the first step to pick up the best wood. Then, of course, we have to choose the, the right 
uh, pattern, uh, we can be inspired of Antonio Stradivari, Guarneri, or we can make our own model. Um, the violin modes bending the wrist by using a special hot iron. This is the, um, the form. The top and the back is cut from outside and inside uh, by using different chisels, planes, and, and gouges. The violin makers use many specialized tools. I will go a little bit quickly. So, you, so um, instrument design and construction is dependent only on its carved lines and surfaces, which are carved and bent for optimum lightness, strength, and flexibility. What is also important uh, that uh, we um, are looking for a wood which we prefer wood cut from the old growth trees, which are uh, which grown at high altitudes on northern slopes. Uh, mostly those kind of wood we can find in in the um, uh, cold climates, um, uh, the closest. Actually, and I know my friends, body makers, they, they buy wood in Canada from here. And my, my sources are basically mostly from Italy or, 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 Carp or Carpathian Mountains. <clears throat> Most of the wood used in vinyl making is split or cut. Um, you can actually see the examples that some of the violins is one piece or two pieces of back or, or, or top. It actually doesn't matter. Uh, if this is one piece of two pieces. There's a picture of base bar, which is actually very important and serves two purposes. The, um, it reinforces the top, making it more rigid and helps distribute the vibrations emanating from the bridge when you play. The violin top has somewhere in the range of 40 pounds of pressure exerted on it through the feet of the bridge. That's why the construction of the violin has to be really, really strong. And the bass bar is very important, uh, important for it. You can see the scroll that we, we uh, carve. It the very important uh, also um, um, part is the varnish, which we use on the last um, step. And varnish it has the three most important function of the uh, for the instrument. The one, the first one is protect the instrument from the negative influences and the dirt. Uh, the second one uh, it should raise the instrument's possibilities of sound, and the third one it should emphasize the wood's natural beauty. There are so many different recipes of the va of the va of the varnish. Uh, some of the makers they use oil varnish based on linseed oil or alcohol. Uh, I would like to actually show you right now, quickly there is some video uh, from Handcrafted America, and I will try to find on the computer and they visited me last year, um, and they made a fantastic documentary program. Um, where is this? Uh, about my craft. And this beautiful lady is a Jill Wagner, 
and they came to my workshop and then actually did this video. Let me do it like this. And hopefully you enjoy. There is a, um, they also show it about the process of valley making. How, and actually there's so, so many pictures at my work workshop. Played on some of the world's most prestigious stages, including Carnegie Hall. And I'm about to meet the man who made it. Here in New York City, Lucas Ronsky makes award-winning, exquisitely crafted violins. With a master's degree in violin making, he immigrated here from Poland 10 years ago. He wanted to see his violins played on the world's greatest stages. Today, he handcrafts violins for professional musicians all around the globe. There's something old to the sound. There's something antique and something special, personal to the sound. This is a wonderful violin and I feel very lucky to play it. It makes my life better. <laughs> Have you been playing very long? I've been playing the violin since I was eight. And then I was 13 when I made my first violin. To be a violin maker is not only, of course, to be a great craftsman, you have to have a great ear, you have to be a musician, you have to be an artist, you have to have a lot of different skills. Lucas definitely has a lot of skills, and one of them is creating modern carvings on the violin that give each instrument its own personality. That's the most unique violin I've ever seen in my really? life, just so you know. Okay. <laughs> it's got a little bit of rock and roll in there too, <laughs> which I love. This violin is inspired of the most famous statue, Statue of Liberty, which is a symbol of peace and tolerance. So the first, the most important thing, we have to find the best wood. Every piece of wood must be seasoned before it's ready to become a violin. When you say seasoned wood, what do you mean? At least six years after it cuts has to, has to be stored, aged. I have many pieces here, like this one. This is maybe at least 80 years old. Lucas uses two types of wood for his instruments. Maple, a stronger wood that goes on the back, sides, and scroll to hold the tension, and lightweight spruce for the top. Lucas uses a plane to smooth the wood he chooses for a new violin. Then he glues the maple pieces together to create the back. Now after we glue the piece together, we, we have to make it even by planing the... We're gonna plane. Yeah. We have to use some tool. Go ahead. Yeah. Wow. Now we have to grab the actual shape pattern of the violin. Okay. So now what we have to do, we have to cut it. We have to cut the shape. We have to right now take care of the curvature here of the violin. You have to do this arching, you know, as a special measurements, of course, special thicknesses. Have you just been doing it so long that you can just look at it and about tell? Basically, yes. There's a little plane. This is the huge one. This is a little one. Okay. So. Baby plane. So we want to make a nice arch. We have to run the wood out. Okay. Now we have to check how thick it is because the violin has to be <laughs> oh my God. has to be has to be strong, but also has to, yet has to be a little bit flexible in order to Good vibrate. A very incredible process is to make this uh, ribs. The ribs to the violin. Sides, ribs. To side, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes, and this is the piece of wood which we use. It's also maple. You can see it's very thin. And now you can see this is the bending iron. It's very hot. And now we have to do it here. Lucas clamps and then glues six bit strips to a temporary wooden mold of the violin. Using a very sharp saw, Lucas carefully cuts the F shape out of the top of the violin. Without this, the sound of the violin would not come out. By knife, we will have to make it more, more even, more beautiful. Now, we want to put together, okay? Lucas uses old Italian recipes for varnish made from linseed oil. He adds natural plant pigment for color. 
Sometimes varnishing, it may take even two weeks or more. The top, or scroll of the violin, is not responsible for the sound, so Lucas can show his artistic side here. This is the Native American, and here, turquoise inlay, and of course, an eagle here. There's an eagle! Do you see it? An eye of the eagle on the back as well. You are a true artist. It takes two months to make a violin, and they start at $25,000. At the end of our day, Lucas shows me what he believes is the most important part of the violin. We call it sound post. A sound post, okay. It's like the soul of Just the violin. This, you can this, hold it, and you can feel this energy. The sound post is wedged between the top and back plate. It transmits the sound of the strings and the bridge to the rest of the violin. And now I demonstrate a little bit different adjustment so you can maybe see a little bit different sound. Yeah. More close, I hear maybe? It. Yeah, yeah, I hear it. The most incredible feeling is when you hear it. It's like, it's like when, you, when you see your, your art actually on the stage. I think it sings now. Mm -hmm. Violins that look cool and sound even cooler. Wool that knitters can use to create warm, cozy sweaters. And putters that improve a golfer's game. This is what makes handcrafting so cool. An artisan makes other people's lives better just by doing what they love. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. <laughs> yeah. And now, actually, the, the, uh, this short movie introduced um, us uh, to King Augustin. And I would like to actually welcome her here. She's one of the most amazing violinists. Um, she also is from Poland. And she's going to play the first uh, on my violin, which I've made, and is actually inspired by the very famous piece of art, uh, Venus de Milo. And it is uh, made to be a uh, Baroque violin, in Baroque style. And Kinga is going to use Baroque bow, and I believe it, she's going to play piece by Bach, right? Which one? Saraband. Saraband. I can't come here.
Thank you, Kinga. Um, I would like to show you actually the, the Venus. How to do it? This one, right? This, yeah? Great. This is the Venus from, from the closer look, and which actually the Kinga just played. So it's kind of unusual, but uh, keeping right, right proportions, the same type of wood, like maple and spruce, and and the right measurements, actually you can achieve this the same kind of type of sound. But m mostly violin makers and and of course my, myself too, we we of course um, copying are copying and is uh, old masters. Um, like like normal instruments. Now Kinga is gonna to play. This is this is her here. She's she she'll be in the world different stages. And now uh, Kinga is going to play on the very old violin from 1734 from Italy, and it's going to be Isai Ballad. Ballad.
It was amazing. Um, I hope Kinga will play one piece more. Um, Kinga, maybe would you like to play one piece more for us? <laughs> but I don't know which one. Um, What is important, actually, what I'd like to say also uh, on the end, that violin makers and musicians all involved hand in hand challenging and inspiring one another in the development of greater technique and tonal, tonal variety. So, this is basically my work as well here in New York, not only making instruments, but fixing them, repairing them. Uh, mostly of my friends, musicians, customers called me doctor. A doctor, you know, <laughs> and they they uh, inspired me. I'm trying to inspire them to to get as best sound as possible, and and we actually work together. And I'm <clears throat> Kinga right now has uh, also a few instruments in her possession. This is one of the oldest uh, instrument, but the instrument has always the problems. We have to maintain maintain them. Um, uh, always has uh, in winter and summer the sound changed a lot. Um, in the same, uh, uh, so Kinga right now we're going to play for us um, which piece, Kinga? I'll play Paganini Caprice. Oh, wonderful. It, it's going to be Paganini Caprice. Number 13. Number 13. Thank you so much, Kinga. Uh, I hope Kinga, did you bring some CDs? Oh yes. So if you if you like to listen at home, she can. She has some CDs, and this was actually music is. Um, 
you know, we can talk about more about the instruments, about the violin making, about the history, but I think it was the, the best and it was actually the music. And thank you so much uh, for listening. Hopefully it was great. And, and you are welcome to ask me questions about, um, about violin making, about music, about the instruments. There are parts of instruments of the table, uh, violins, some viola, there are a few bows, and you, can, you, you, you are very welcome to, to, to see this. Thank you so much. Uh, as you were learning your trade um, for the purposes of experimenting, for example, did you ever um, make an instrument that was, you know, um, a quarter of an inch bigger or smaller to see what would happen and if the strings could be tuned mm -hmm. to something acceptable? Um, yes, of course. We, you, you, uh, as an artist, violin maker, of course, I, I cannot copy exactly everything what, what there is on the table. And uh, we, of course, we cannot um, uh, these days exact make the same instrument like they used to do it because we don't have the same kind of type of wood. And of course, we don't know exactly everything. And, uh, and it's almost impossible. It, like in music and arts, it's almost impossible to copy exact. Um, and um, I have a lot of uh, teachers, masters that they, they, of course, teach the rules. They teach how we, we should, what we should follow. But of course, many of them they were also open-minded, of different types or different styles. And as you see, actually, this one of the violin which I've made, is Lady Liberty violin, is of course different scroll. I'm not sure if I have the. I don't have it. I don't have a picture, but there is also different shape. So I'm I'm not afraid to do different experiments, and which mostly are in the in the direction not to change the sound, because the sound of the violin actually we want to make it as best as possible, as beautiful as possible, not by changing different type of woods or different uh, different shapes. We, you know, this this is only in the in, uh, changing in the art field more than, than to, to change something, because the, whatever was done, the violin is actually the perfect, perfect thing. So Already. as long as the sound is right, are, are your clientele open yes. to the idea of an artistic exactly. expression? Exactly, and I think these days many, young, many musicians are very open also to different ideas, and if only they can have in, the, in their hands instruments which sounds good, and, and can be compared to the old instruments, they are, they, there's no problem they can use it. On the, so, the most, so basically the question is the sound, because this is the most important thing for, for musician. Um, do you use the same varnish on all your violins or do you adjust it? Um, as, as I said before, I like to experiment with also in, in different type of varnishes. I used to do alcohol varnish based on al alcohol. So there we use a different type of, of rosins, rosins like shellac, mastix, amber, and different type of, uh, type of rosin. Or these days I'm using oil varnish which is based on uh, linseed oil. Well, how, how can you test it? I mean, do you do you test it on a piece of wood and yes, before varnishing of course of the violin because I don't want to ruin too quickly um, uh, we we have to taste it on the small pieces of wood and and even though later we we after the process because this process is not quickly for, uh, to varnish violin is maybe about two weeks or or a month even depends on the weather because also oil varnish dries very very slow. Um, I've read that um, violinists have said until they had such and such violin, they did not, it did not, they had not found the violin that fit and brought the best out from them. What does that mean? 
Um, how would you, if I came to you and mm. said I need a violin that would fit me, that would oh, bring see, out see, the see. best from me, sure. how would you help me do that? <laughs> this is the, the part of my job actually also, to, to uh, give advices to musicians, to, to see what is their needs. Uh, different person, they, they like different type of instrument, different sound. Sometimes also they are confused, they don't know what they are looking for. They're coming to me and they, they try to explain what they are looking for. Uh, because it's not a shoe store or something that you can actually have five pairs of shoes. You are looking for violin, which might be, might be only one actually for whole your life. So you have to match, of course, uh, the sound, the size of the violin or then the violas of the cello. In bigger instruments like viola, the very important actually is also the measurements that fits your body and your hand. So this is also very important, um, those ergonomics parts of it that actually have to be very comfortable uh, for, for a person to play. Then uh, there is a bow, which actually I didn't, I didn't talk today, but it's also a very, very important part uh, to the musical um, bow in str string instruments, uh, bows are so important that actually they, they, it could be another another lecture of them, and because we, you know the, the strength, the, the the heaviness, the lightness, also has to match the the right player and the right hand. So there are many so many factors. So it's actually hard to hard to say. And that's why by um, experiments and by choosing and, and spending time with the different type of violins, you, you will find the right one later, of course. Uh, I don't mean to be naive, but could you explain a little bit about why a Stradivarius is so extremely valuable? <laughs> I know it's... Stradivari was one, it is, and it was actually one of the most famous violin maker in history. Uh, of course, among the, the Giuseppe Guarneri del Gesù, Amati, and others. But of course, Antonio Stradivari is the most famous because we hear a lot of him. He was actually famous as well uh, during his lifetime. He was very famous, so people even in England, they were copying of his violins. So they were already make fakes at the same even century of Sadivari because of the value and of the, of course, monetary investments. And, and until, until these days, instruments of Antonio Stadivari, they are soft after instruments that everyone would like to have it. Not even because of the sound, frankly speaking, but because of the value. Um, there is many instruments of Stadivari which, which sounds really great. Few of them maybe even doesn't sound. A few of them that are in the museums, which are even not used, but the value is still uh, very, very um, extremely high, and and this is the the value of the art object and the investors. Uh, this is also many many investors buying instruments and the investment, because the the market shows us that those instruments they they are actually good. Uh, good investments on the market. Did I answer the question? Uh, the, basically, instruments, as I said, is like an art object, so it, it, it is value as a name. Uh, the violin can sound amazing and has a name, and maybe maybe right wrong, maybe it's not Antonio Stradivari, and it, and. <clears throat> So, of course, the wood is so important, but, but the price uh, makes, the, uh, makes the, uh, the recognition of the, of the maker, you know, uh, from the violins, cellos of both. Is the, the, the name is the most important to value uh, an object. Lucas, how did you connect with the violin that Kinga played that what, dated back to, to, to 1724 or 34. How did you come across that violin? This violin actually, it belongs to our great friend, which is, which is here, Gabriel. And he, he actually, he was so, so generous that he could um, um, uh, let Kinga play on the violin. And it's of course a gorgeous instrument. 
and is this the name is Zanot Zanelli, right? Zanotti, right? And it's a very 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 old instrument from uh, from Milan uh, um, city, from Italy. Take one more. Can you talk a little bit more about the selection of the woods, the process, and what you're really looking for when you're selecting that specific piece of spruce or maple? And at what point in the process of planing and chiseling the soundboard and the backs, do you know you have a certain sound that you're looking for? Um, we choose the best wood uh, of always, so we are looking for the wood which is acoustically the best for instruments, which is spruce and maple. Uh, of, there are also a few different types of wood like poplar, willow, which also might be used in instruments, but most common is maple for uh, back, ribs and scroll, and spruce for the top. Uh, why you use it? Because acoustically reasons, it's light wood and, and it still uh, gives the best, the best results for the sound. And uh, you ask me how, how I know uh, the, the, during the process how we're going to be sound. We actually don't know uh, until we put the strings on and we play what kind of sound we will, we will have it. It's almost impossible. But of course during the experiments, and, and years of studying, we can kind of imagine uh, which direction we, we have to go, how much wood we have to take, and of course by, by uh, tapping the wood and listening the sound of the wood, of touching in it, and, uh, and, and then we can, we can hear it, because each wood has in, its own frequency and, and, and its own um, sound, so we, actually, we, can, we can actually hear it before. But uh, on, to the end, there are so many parts with violins, back, top, ribs, there is a sound post, there is a bass bar, and, uh, and each part is so important. So it's so complex, so um, making the instrument, we cannot actually to the end um, know what kind of sound we have it. Even when the instrument is completely done, and we have strings on, we have the bridge, there is another process to adjust it properly. Also the instrument after that it needs a little bit more time to settle down and to be played on. From the, at the beginning the instrument sometimes doesn't sound as good. So that's why this, this is the, we spend another time to, to make it as bad as possible. We adjust it, we sometimes change different strings, we, we change different, different sound posts, we adjust it and a musician has to play on the instrument and during months, years, is going to be even better. Good violin and, and in age is going to be better and better. The bad violin it won't be actually better, you know, after, after many years. Yeah? <laughs> Yeah, Lucas? The, the last photo I will show you. This is my assistant, Toto. <laughs> okay. uh, Lucas, yes. on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, I want to say what an honor it has been this evening to have you talk about your craft. You've embodied everything we want the artisan lectures to be. You've spoken so beautifully about your craft. You are a true artist. The violins you've created are truly beauty meeting a function. And it was to thank you so much for a, fant for a fantastic presentation. I'd like to ask the audience to give you a round of applause once more. I also want to express our great appreciation to Kinga for her absolute exquisite playing. And, and Kinga, I would like to ask if you could join us at the front. 
Um, for those of you who have been here before, you know that uh, traditionally we make a presentation uh, to the participating speaker. And so in this case, we would like to honor uh, Lucas and Kinga for their participation in the Artisan Lecture Series. And so to do so, uh, here is Victoria Dangle, our executive director again. Yes, and, and thank you, Lucas, and thank you, Kinga. And I have to say, I met Lucas about, I had to be about five years ago, when Lucas came each um, July, the General Society, in addition to many of its activities, we do a full reading of the Declaration of Independence, and we have done that since 1793, and we haven't missed a year, and we have records to prove it. But um, Lucas came to the event with Lady Liberty and performed for us, and it was just such an incredibly memorable event. It was so poignant. And uh, we, we've never let him go since then. So on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, founded 1785, uh, we express our gratitude to Lucas Ronsky of Lucas Violin, Violin Maker for his participation in the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen Artists and Lecture Series. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> And we also, of course, um, have made you an honorary lifetime member of the library. So visit us often. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And Kinga, thank you so much for your exquisite performance. And you said that um, the, the violin, uh, you said something about it making your life better. Well, your or an artist like you and an artisan like Lucas, I think I speak for everyone when I say you make our lives better. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> On behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, founded 1785, we express our gratitude to Kinga Augustine, violinist, for her participation in the General Society Artists and Lecture Series. So thank you, Kinga. Thank you. Aw, thank you. <laughs> and that's for you. And you're, all, you're also a lifetime member of the library. <laughs> you can come together. So thank you. Thank you. And also with uh, Meg Stanton, we'll give you this. Well, <laughs> our program we'll coordinator. Be my right. right. So, thank right. you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Yes, thank yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah.